Hello, I'm a, my name is Daniel Fiat. I'm a doctoral uh, researcher here at the Institute for European Studies um, and I focus mainly on uh, the European Union's common security and defence policy in my research. Uh, today's podcast uh, will be looking at uh, the European Union's common security and defence policy or CSDP and we'll be specifically looking at the, the missions which the EU deploys um, and the capabilities which underpin these missions. And then in the final part of the fo- podcast we'll also be looking at uh, the future of the policy and some of the challenges uh, which face uh, the European Union. Firstly, on the missions, the first question we have to ask is whether or not the European Union is indeed uh, a civilian and military actor. And the simple answer to that question is yes, it is. Um, It deployed its first military mission in 2003 to Macedonia under Operation Concordia. And since that time, it has deployed over 20 missions to various parts of the world. Uh, These missions have taken on very, very different characteristics and to meet different strategic objectives. For example, the European Union had deployed a mission to Chad and the Central African Republic in order to protect refugees from the Janjaweed rebels which had come from Darfur. On the other hand, it has also deployed naval vessels off the coast of the Horn of Africa to deal with piracy uh, of Somalia. Uh, The European Union's uh, uh, military and civilian missions um, last for varying degrees of time. Uh, Normally, uh, the European Union deploys to the field for one year. Um, This can occur through uh, different levels of personnel numbers. Um, The European Union, for example, in its mission to the Ukraine and to Moldova for border assistance, uh, deployed over 300 European Union staff working in tandem with local staff on the ground in Ukraine and Moldova. Now these numbers are relatively small when one compares to the deployment levels of regional actors such as NATO. For example, the security force which was sent to Afghanistan under NATO had troop levels of over 100,000, so there's an enormous difference. Uh, In terms of the costs of such missions, uh, these also uh, uh, vary in degree as well. For example, the European Union's police mission to Iraq Uh, cost the European Union uh, 29 million and the European Union's mission uh, to the Ukraine and to Moldova cost 27 million uh, euros. In order for the European Union to deploy a military mission or civilian mission um, to a third country there is quite a rigid process. Um, Firstly the European Union in keeping with its mantra of effective multilateralism um, seeks a United Nations resolution uh, for the action. Uh, On this basis, the European Union then consults with some of its other partners, uh, such as NATO, and also starts a discussion with the member states within the European Union. And finally, it also tries to have a discussion with the host nation in which a mission is to be deployed. Um, On the basis of these three conditions, and considering if the member states are actually willing to deploy under a UN mandate, then the European Union will go ahead and draw up Uh, the operational plan for the deployment. The institutional process for the deployment is quite interesting also. Um, First of all we have what's called the Political and Security Committee which is made up of um, representatives from the member states and chaired by the European Commission representative and in this council there is a debate over the operational and strategic elements of each mission. Uh, The council then has to authorize uh, uh, the deliberations which take place in the uh, PSC And then this goes on to much more operational planning, first of all under a concept of operations or CONOPS, and then finally to the nitty-gritty of the mission under the O-plan or the operational plan. Once the European Union has deployed a mission um, to a third country, um, it has an interlinkage between the field or the theatre of crisis um, and the European Union institutions. Uh, In Brussels there is an operational commander who links up with a field commander in the country uh, where the mission has been deployed. And there is continuous debate, continuous um, uh, monitoring of the situation and of, or of the mission here in Brussels through the Political and Security Committee. Now we'll move on to the uh, capabilities which the European Union has at its disposal for such missions. Now it's clear to say that without the right type of capabilities, it's rather uh, difficult for the European Union to deploy and also to meet its objectives uh, for any crisis situation. So the main question we have to ask is whether or not the European Union has its own capabilities at hand. Well, 
the easy answer to this question is, well, not really. Apart from the European Union Satellite Centre, which can be found in Spain, there are very few assets which are uh, passed on to the European Union level and which the European Union has it, a mandate to use on its own basis. Um, essentially what we're talking about when we talk of uh, the deployment of military missions or civilian missions um, is the sourcing of capabilities, and capabilities can mean troops, um, can mean jet fighters, can mean naval vessels and so forth, um, from the member states. Um, for example, when the European Union deployed its mission to Chad and Central Africa, it had to rely on a contingent of 2,000 troops uh, given to the mission by France. Um, and also there were Irish, uh, Polish, Romanian, Swedish and Finnish troops uh, involved. And also the French uh, donated, as it were, eight helicopters to the mission as well. Um, and a host of other countries were involved in, in supplying capabilities for the mission. So as you can see, it's quite a difficult process in trying to get all the willing member states together to source the capabilities and to then deploy them in the field of action. On the civilian side of things, the story is slightly different. Whereas the European Union has very limited military capabilities at its disposal, uh, from a civilian point of view, the European Union can draw on a number of experts found within the European External Action Service and its own uh, experts, such as uh, judicial experts, legal experts, development aid experts, and so forth, um, who are recruited by the European Union themselves and deployed to the field. So any one mission will always be uh, a mixture of military personnel and military capabilities and also civilian capabilities and civilian personnel. One other area where the European Union can uh, source capabilities, of course, is through NATO. We have what is called the Berlin Plus Agreement, which is an agreement between NATO and the European Union, so that if there is a mission which the NATO member states do not wish to undertake on their own, and the European Union does, then there is agreement that the European Union can borrow or lease some of the capabilities made available through NATO. Another question we have to ask is, is there a plan of action within the European Union to build and uh, construct the type of capabilities uh, which are needed for the European Union's missions. Um, there has been a problem within the European Union in terms of its missions of sourcing uh, equipment such as helicopters, for example. And there is an understandable question then to ask, well, is the European Union in a position to try and uh, source or develop these capabilities? Well, in a word, the European Union has tried uh, working with the member states to try and develop what's called the Capability Action Plan or a Capability Development Plan. This was designed in 2001 and since that time the European Union has tried to put together a, a force catalogue of assets which can be found at the member states which could be used for European Union missions. This translated in what was called the Headline Goal 2010. Uh, this is a document which first outlined all of the military missions which the European Union would be willing to undertake, and second of all, to try and match to that the types of capabilities that would be needed to ensure that the missions are a success. Um, also, it must be stated that the European Union, the European Council in particular, have set up an agency, the European Defence Agency, to try and work with the member states to try and develop the type of capabilities which the European Union might need in the field and to do so on a pan-European basis. On top of this, the Lisbon Treaty brought in an interesting provision or protocol called the Protocol on Permanent Structured Cooperation. This is a mechanism which allows the member states under certain, certain circumstances uh, to develop capabilities together uh, for such missions. Since the Lisbon Treaty was ratified and, and uh, brought into force in 2009, there have been a number of member states who have decided to cooperate through certain agreements uh, to meet these capability demands. For example, the Lancaster treaties signed between France and the United Kingdom are a good example of two countries recognising uh, that they need to work together to develop capabilities such as the rapid reaction forces. So now we've looked at the missions and capabilities um, which impact and which are part of the European Union's common security and defence policy. Well, now it's also necessary to look a little bit at the future and to see what types of problems or challenges face the European Union when it comes to the deployment of military missions and to develop the types of capabilities. The first major question is the rationale for such missions which are deployed under the CSDP. 
it's clear that the European Union um, is willing under certain circumstances to deploy still to many crisis situations. The recent crisis in Mali, uh, the missions which were needed in Sudan, in South Sudan, um, are all testament to the fact that the European Union still wishes to deploy uh, missions for crisis situations. But there are a number of questions on the horizon which will challenge the assumption that the European Union is just a crisis actor. The first of which is the Eurozone crisis in itself and the budgetary pressures which are placed on the member states. In short, this means that there is less money going around in the European Union and governments in the member states have to try and negotiate where the cuts will fall. And in certain, in certain member states, these cuts have already fallen on defence budgets. So the question there for many ministers in, in the European Union, and indeed for the European Union itself, is what can be achieved at the European level uh, with lower defence costs um, coming from the member states? Are we able to afford the types of capabilities that we need for, for these missions? And are the member states even willing? This comes on to a, an, a second important question, which can be called the, if you will, the post-Afghanistan blues. And this really is a question of whether or not the member states are willing to deploy uh, to many crisis situations for a prolonged period of time. Let's, not, let's also remember that these missions, if they last for five, ten years, are draining on defence budgets. And of course there's the human tragedy element of troops being killed in the field. Uh, the Libya case is quite interesting because there was again no broad consensus within the European Union uh, as to whether or not to deploy. And the French and the British had to deploy in the end with NATO assets, that is, with the support of the United States. But, of course, there are some traditional divisions within the European Union as to whether or not the European Union should be intervening in every single situation, uh, given the costs and given also the political consequences of this. There is a third element which is, is important and central to this, and that is the changing nature of international politics in itself. Uh, we can see that the United States... Uh, slowly moving uh, their defence posture to Asia. Um, this raises inevitably some serious questions about the nature of US and European cooperation when it comes to security affairs. The US have made it plain to the European Union that it needs to take care of its own capabilities, it needs to take care of its own uh, political willingness to deal with security crises in its own neighbourhood. Um, whether or not the shift by the United States to Asia will put pressure on the European Union to really move forward with these uh, uh, developments and what strain that will place on the NATO alliance uh, are open questions for the future. But they all tie into a central question about the willingness of member states to remain and to retain their cooperation uh, under the common security and defence policy. This is the largest open question. Um, it is a thought-provoking question, actually, as to what the rationale will be for Europe's defence policy, what type of cooperation we will see between the member states, given the uh, divisions which can be seen between the Eurozone members and the larger EU. Uh, and these are all open questions which will need to be answered over the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you.